GG in, take one. <laughs> Good morning, Grove. Welcome to the very first Christmas edition of GGN. As you can tell, they've decorated behind me and it's beautiful. It makes me look very nice. All right, today we have a few special announcements for you. First off, if you're a first time guest with us, please step out to the lobby and get your jar of jelly and leave some information so that we can stay in touch with you. Also, we have a special Christmas service that's coming up on December 20th. We ask that you invite all your friends and bring your family. It's going to be a great time. This Christmas season, the Grove is doing something that's so cool. We are actually having carolers out singing in the community for the people that are locked in and i'm going to throw to pat while he's out there with them thank you andy and good morning grove family it is christmas season yes indeed we have our carolers out on the shepherd hill campus we are bringing them gifts due to the covid 19 breakout they are quarantined and cannot be with us in the sanctuary so guess what we came to them and it is a wonderful place out here the kids were very happy to see us. Our carolers did a wonderful job. Grow family, that's what it's all about. As you will see coming around behind me, this is our team of carolers that make all the magic happen. Carolers, give the Grow family a big wave. Everybody had a wonderful Sunday. Back to you, Andy. Dude, thanks, Pat. That was so awesome to see. Next, we have our student ministries. We only got a few weeks left in December. And they start at 6.30 to 8.15. So any of you guys that are out there, or girls, uh, that would love to be a part, please come and hang out with us. Thank you guys so much for spending some time with us today. We love that you're here. We just ask now that you step into a moment of worship with us. See 
How many of you know what Noel is spelled backwards? Leon. Yeah, baby. Leon. All right. <clears throat> Somebody sent me a note the other day. My old pastor from Greenville, Alvin McLaren, a good friend of mine, and he had uh, he had the he had Leon spelled out in four letters on his on his uh, table that someone had sent him, and he said we're sending these back because I ordered Noel, and I don't know what the problem is. He said, "Do you know anybody named Leon that might like them?" I said, "Send them on down, brother A, brother A." This morning I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter number 25. As we have worked through the book of Proverbs this whole year, learning the art of living. We call the series the Art of Living series because this book has so much to do with every theme or topic in your life. If you need to know anything about your marriage, anything about your parenting, anything about children, anything about community, anything about work, anything about laziness, anything about stewardship, anything about prosperity. I mean, I'm, I can go and go and go because this book is an amazing book full of life principles. Now, in Proverbs chapter 25, I could not, it was very difficult because as I, I worked through this and I worked through every verse and every word trying to discern what is the one subject that I need to focus on for our people today and and uh, because there's no way I can preach all you know all the proverbs and and uh, every little piece of the proverbs in this book but I can do something and that's what I've sought to do something so that we can grow and that you and I can be challenged and we can be built up with the word of God this chapter number 25 is a it's a transition chapter in the book of Proverbs. If you'll look at 25 verse number 1 now, God be our helper today, and you guys be praying. We'll just walk through it, and then I'll land on one particular verse and, and stop there, okay? But I want to just take you a moment into God's Word and uh, the enjoyment of God's Word, and, and I want you to grow. The Bible said in Proverbs chapter number 25 verse number 1, these also are proverbs of solomon now we read that all the way back in chapter number one but this is a new section because these proverbs were the proverbs that the men of hezekiah and hezekiah was the king of judah and he was a good king he was a good king he had his issues at the end but he was a good king he had a desire for god's will and the Bible said that these were the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, that they copied. So they found the, the writings of Solomon. The Bible said that Solomon wrote more than 2,000 proverbs. And so we don't have all of them, but we have a lot of them. And these men dug up in some probably dusty old cell that God providentially wanted them to know and find, that they dug up and they found the Proverbs of Solomon that were additional to the ones that we have back through verse uh, through 1 through 24. So the Bible said that they, they wrote in, they, they listened or read what was written, and this was written in these Proverbs that were found. The Bible said, it is the glory, the glory of God to conceal things. Now, when you're reading Scripture, you have to stop and say, let's think about that a few moments. But how many of you would agree that we don't know everything about God that we might like to know? How many of you know that there are things that God knows that you and I don't know? Anybody want to disagree with that statement? Because in order to say that, you have to say, I know it all. And I just want you to know, if you know it all, nobody wants to know you. I don't mean to be ugly, but that's the God's truth. Nobody knows it all. But the Bible said it's the glory of God to conceal things. The Bible said in Deuteronomy 29, 29, that the secret things belong to God. And you and I have to just go ahead and accept this. We don't know everything. We will never know everything. But we can be in pursuit of knowing things that God wants us to know. But when we get to heaven, our minds will be blown again at how much we didn't know. 
So be careful if you want to come across as a know-it-all. People who know, know you don't know. And therefore, stop acting like that. The Bible then says, but the glory of a king or the glory of a leader is to search things out. And every king, every leader, every president, they need to be in the know. They need to know things. So there are things that people need to know. There are things that God knows. And there are people who need to pursue the knowledge of God to know things that we need to know so we can grow. Then the Bible said, as the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. In that heart of a leader, there's a deepness, there's a depth, and there should be a confidence and a confidentiality in what we do know that we might not be able to share with the whole wide world. So there is this, this whole this whole thing about leadership and learning and growing and being wise about how to share what we know and how to be wise about holding back things that we may know in order not to hurt other people. Then the Bible said in verse number 4, Take away the dross from the silver, and the smith or the blacksmith has material for a vessel. Getting something prepared, getting something ready to be used in greater ways. Then the scripture says, take away the wicked from the presence of the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. So a kingdom needs to have righteousness in it, and we need to remove the wickedness from it so that there can be purity in it. Very, very timely text of scripture for any nation to pay attention to that God blesses righteousness in a nation. And then the scripture says, verse number 6, do not put yourself forward in the king's presence. This is a wonderful practical lesson about life. Do not promote yourself. Do not promote yourself in the king's presence or in some leader that you admire. Don't try to push your way up to the front. The Bible said, or stand in the place of the great. For it is far better, the scripture says, this is wisdom. If that leader says, come up here, than to say to you, we need you to move from here to the lower part of the table. That's a terrible thing to be sitting here and the leader says, I'm sorry, that's already reserved. We're going to need you to step here and go there. That's a terrible moment. That's an embarrassing moment. But the writer is saying, please be careful not to promote yourself let God promote you. Let others say things well about you. But don't be pushy about trying to make people know who you are. Look, to be a friend, you need to know who they are. Eventually, they will love to know who you are. But at first, don't try to tell everybody who you are. Get to know other people and other things about other people. It will be a beautiful thing in life. So this little scripture says, don't promote yourself. Be patient. Wait on God. He's got a plan for your life. Now, ver I'm just going to stop. Down. I'm going to just drop down here to verse number 11. Because verse 11 is where I want to park for a few moments. It's just where I want to talk and see what God has to say to us. This is a phrase in Scripture that so impacted my life years and years ago. When I was first reading through the Bible, I remember this phrase. So this phrase is almost a 40 year uh, impact on my life but it says this a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver whenever you think about apples of gold in settings of silver your mind immediately sees the image that is being made you can see a golden delicious apple and you can see it arranged in a beautiful, ornate silver bowl. And immediately you think about how impactful or how that image is lasting, how that image is, is just fixed in your mind. And you will never, ever not be able to see again those apples of gold and those pictures of silver. For me in my Bible study, over the last almost 40 years, there are words that have had an impact in my life. There are words that have made a, a direct connection in my life. I was telling a, a friend this morning that 
I think it's in the book of, of Ecclesiastes. It talks about the, the preacher and the preacher using, he sought for the word. That's what the Bible said. He sought for the word, that the word would be the appropriate, correct word in order to use in this situation, in this moment or this season. And he said, I, I want it to be the word to be like a nail. And when I say the word, I want the power of the Holy Spirit to hit the nail and to sink it deep inside the soul of the one who hears it. Every preacher worth his salt prays that the word of God would be like a nail in your heart set by the Holy Spirit so that the devil could not quickly come and pull it out but that the Word of God would find good lodging inside your soul. And that's what preachers want if they are worth their salt in preaching. It is not our words because using our words absolutely clutters and confuses and clouds things up. But using God's Word, and God's Word is eternal, and therefore it is never out of date, God's Word can set and be sunk and sink deep into your heart and it will ever 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 impact you for the rest of your life like an image of apples and silver apples of gold and silver so when I first got saved I had uh, I somehow or another stumbled upon my grandfather's Bible and my grandfather had a quote in his Bible and I love the quote now I will share that quote with you at the end of the message but it introduced me to an individual that I had not known before in my lifetime. You may have never heard of him either. His name is C.T. Studd. Now that's a good name, brother. Say amen right there. C.T. Studd. You can't hardly beat that, bro. That's a great name. So I started learning a little bit about C.T. Studd. And I started learning that he was really, he was a powerful preacher. He was an amazing athlete. But he gave up his career as an athlete to be a missionary to China, to India, to Africa. Listen, I mean, he gave it all in order to go and do what God called him to do. And I grew in admiration for Stud. And I have things that he has said over the years that have been like apples of gold and pictures of silver to me. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to just read some quotes to you that have impacted my life over the last 40 years. And things that have, have, have sunk like nails inside my spirit that I can't get over that are still in me to this very day. So I want to read some of these, what I call, fine phrases that forever impacted my life. One of the first phrases he said, and I brought them up on the board for you today so that you can read along with me. I'm going to give you some quotes. These are all by stud. This is what he said as a missionary. He said, number one, if Jesus Christ... And if the booth can just walk with me. There you go. Thank you, booth. If Jesus Christ be God, and how many of you believe he is, say amen. If Jesus Christ be God, and I hate the, the conditional there because I don't believe it's an if, but this is the way he stated it. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice that I could make for him could ever be too great. And God's people said, you can't make a sacrifice greater than the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you. Study the cross, study the cradle, study the crown. Realize God gave it all so that you and I could enjoy it all. No sacrifice too great. When we were, I, I was just watching people the other night. They were coming out and they were, uh, they were uh, giving their Thursday nights. And then last night I, I came and we were working with high school students and I saw lots and lots of adults giving their life, giving their Saturday nights to minister to high school students. And I just thought, I know it's a sacrifice, but in light of what Jesus Christ did, it's no sacrifice. And the reality is the more I watch the adults work with the students, the more I realize it wasn't a sacrifice at all. It was pure joy, pure joy. You know why some people have no joy in their life? Because you had not done anything for anybody but you in a long time. 
You want to get some joy back in your life? Hey, change your life and go serve somebody. Do something this Christmas for somebody else and not just yourself. God will turn some joy bells back on in your heart. He'll refresh you in light of the commitment that Jesus made. All right, I'm moving on. The Bible said this. I love this. He said, C.T. Studd said this. Some people want to live within the sound of a church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. No, God's people said. The Bible said, this, this, I'm sorry, I see it say the Bible. C.T. said this. Let us not, I love this one. Oh, he said, let us not glide through this world and then slip quietly into heaven without having blown the trumpet loud and long for our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. He said, let us see to it that the devil will hold a thanksgiving service in hell when he gets the news that our departure from the field of battle has arrived. How many of you, I tell you what, I want the devil to rejoice in hell that I'm dead. I do. I want him to say, I'm so sick and tired of appling. I'm so sick and tired of him praying. I'm so sick and tired of him opening up God's word. I'm so sick and tired of him. I will throw a party in hell the day he dies. I hope that's true. I hope that I'm not so, so, so weak and so just, just pitiful that the devil wouldn't even recognize. I want to be a soldier on the battlefield of God and I want to fight for the battle and for the right and do right and live right. And, and, and I don't want hell to ever, ever, ever not despise me. Billy Sunday was an old preacher, gospel evangelist in America. He used to be a baseball player. And I, I'm telling you, he had, he had phrases that were like apples of gold and pictures of silver. And I remember old Sunday said, He'd stand up there and he'd preach. He'd pick his old hand up there and he'd growl his voice like this right here. He'd say, I want the devil to know. As long as I got a fist, I'm going to hit him. He said, as long as I got a foot, I'm going to kick him. He said, as long as I got a good knee, I'm going to knee him. He said, as long as I got a head, I'm going to butt him. He said, as long as I got teeth, I'm going to bite him. He said, when I get old, and he said, I can't hit him no more, and I can't kick him no more, and I can't knee him no more, and I can't headbutt him no more, and my teeth have fallen out, and I can't bite him no more, I'm going to gum him till I die. <laughs> Come on. Now, I love Billy Sunday because he said, you know what? I ain't got no time for the devil. And I hope he ain't got no time for me. And I want to be a man of God in the kingdom of God, serving in the family of God to make a difference in this life for the glory of God. And I believe old C.T. had it. I believe that Billy Sunday had it. Billy Sunday, I mean, C.T. said this. He said, God's real people have always been called fanatics. And some of you are too prideful and dignified. You don't want to be thought uncultured or you don't want to be thought improper in this world. And you want to fit into our culture and blend in and look so much like the world and act so much like the world that you don't want to be a ripple in the world. You just want to kind of blend in and, and, and just, you know, just live the life of the world and make everybody happy around you. And you don't want to be considered a fanatic for the Lord Jesus Christ. But I remember my old preacher he used to say, he said, they call me a nut for God, but I'll tell you, I'm a nut screwed on the right bolt. And I loved it. And I appreciated it. And I'll tell you what, most of y'all are nuts. The question is, what you screwed on to, amen? <laughs> the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Say it. I'm not my own. Say it. I'm not my own. But the Bible said you were bought with a what? Say it. Price. You were bought with a, with a what? Price. And the Bible says so glorify God in your body. And I'll tell you if there's any impetus in your heart today to beat for the glory of God, it's a right one. But if there's no desire in your heart to beat for the glory of God, it's a wrong one. You get up in the morning for the glory of God. Kick off the covers for the glory of God. Get about your day for the glory of God. Live in your relationships for the glory of God. Pay your bills for the glory of God. Work a day's work for the glory of God. Sleep at night for the glory of God. You don't own 
anything. God Almighty paid for it all. Everything we got to give from God. Everything we have. You say, I got a house to go to today. I'll tell you, if it weren't for God's grace and breath and air in your lungs, you wouldn't have that house today. You got a nice little car to ride home in today. Thank God for the four wheels and the tires and the motors and transmission. God provided it. God provided it. You say, no, I got up and worked hard for it. Let God take the breath that he gave away from you and see how long you work. Well, I got ten of those phrases, and that's point one. I remember Jim Elliott. He stuck in my heart. Jim Elliott was a a, a man of God who was martyred by the Alka Indians, and God brought a revival through his death down there in South America and revel, I mean, just literally radically changed the tribe of Indians for the glory of God. And it was this statement, this apple of gold and a picture of silver that he said, a man is no fool to give up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Stay with me, Booth. A man, come on, because I want him to be able to see it. And I don't know, yeah, okay, so you got that. I'm, I'm looking at two different things. All right, I just want to make sure everybody's with me on the same page. A man is no fool to give up what he cannot keep. And you think about that. Well, so many people believe the man who dies at the end of his life with the most toys win. And I want you to know, you may gain all the toys of this world, but you can't keep them when you die. A man is no fool to give up all the toys or to gain what he cannot keep or to keep what he cannot gain or to gain and, and, and what he cannot lose. A man is no fool, let's just be clear, to give up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. To me, that is an apple of gold and a picture of silver. And it is a phrase that is so beautiful. It's stunningly beautiful. It is so powerful. It is so poignant. It is so direct. It is so real. It is so thought-provoking. What a phrase. It's beautiful. And it's challenging. And I wrote in my notes, what will you be remembered for in this life? A man who gained everything in this world or a man who gave up this world in order to gain what he will not lose in the next world. The word of God goes on and the Bible said in Mark 8, 36, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? You stand before the judgment bar of God and you have all the silver and riches of this world you try to pay God for an entrance into heaven, God will say, unacceptable. Silver and gold will not buy your way into heaven. Only the precious blood of my son that was shed on Calvary's cross for your sin is the only way in. I wrote in my notes a a, a phrase that an academic had said, but I do appreciate it. And so it sounds a tad bit academic, but the reality is it's really practical. But it stuck with me. He said, I would rather have the spiritual endowment of power. Now think about that. I would rather have the spiritual endowment of power. Because it is more important than educational advancement. Now, I love education. And I've been a student basically my whole Christian life. I've desired to learn and to grow and to know. And I'll tell you why. I had a curiosity about me when I got saved. And the curiosity was, I I, want to know what God said. And I wanted to know it so bad that I... I, I, it's not that I didn't trust people and I appreciated the preachers in my life but I just wasn't content with a second hand knowledge I had to know what God said how God said it when God said it why God said it where God said it what God said so that I could bring that into my heart and have the conviction 
to live the life that God called me to live. And I'll tell you, apart from the Word of God, I would never have the conviction to do what God called me to do. I'd cave every time. But every now and then, there's a situation, a temptation, a, a situation that arises. And I'll tell you what, the instant I'm in that moment, God brings a word that I memorized years ago and put it right into my mind and said, Hey, hey! Stand right here and don't you cave into that temptation. Why? Because the Word of God, first-hand knowledge, is what you need in the day of battle every day. And you know, some of you are just content to let somebody else tell you what it said. I appreciate that, but that is not convicting to me. What is convicting to me is when you know what God said and you believe what God said and you read what God says and you put that in your heart and you, you bury it in your soul and then God's got something to draw from when the battle day comes in your life. And I, I would just rather have spiritual power from God than all. And I love education, like I said. But I, I, you, with, without the power of God, it's just like words that just kind of blah, 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 blah. But the power of God will sink that word deep in your soul. And I'll never forget the day I was preaching. Oh, boy, I got in trouble, too. And, and I know some of you are going to sh be shocked that I actually got in trouble somewhere, but I really did get in trouble up there. Uh, and as a matter of fact, um, I've never been invited back, uh, but it was a good day while I was there. And so when I went there, I was invited to a Christian college. And I say Christian because when I walked on campus, that was not what impacted me. Everything I looked at, didn't, it, I didn't sense Christian. I didn't, what's going on here? And then I met people in the faculty and profs and PhDs and DDDs and LDDs and all these people with all these titles behind their name. And, and they, were, they, were, they weren't friendly. They were, very, they were cold in my estimation. And I just thought, well, that's weird. It's weird. And then we went into chapel and they introduced me and, and I stood up and I began to preach. And I'm telling you, when I started preaching, there was a chill in the air. And I couldn't, I didn't know what to do about that because I was not used to that condition. I've been used to preaching at the Grove where it's warm and loving and inviting and fun. And these people were like stoic and not, they weren't even interested and they had their heads down. And so I'm about 10, 12 minutes into this thing and I said, hey, hey, hey. Now that'll normally get them to look up. And there's a lot of people in the room. I said, hey, ho, 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 no. I said, I have made a grave mistake here today. I thought I was at a Christian college. That's exactly what they did. I said, this is the coldest room I've preached to in a long time. If I knew it was a secular college, I would have changed my message to direct it to people who are lost. Now, it's quiet by then. But they are looking this time. And I said, I appreciate the fact that we have high standards for academics. And I do appreciate the people who have worked hard to get PhDs. In the country, we call it post hole diggers or a good Pentecostal hairdo. But I understand in the academic world, it's a, di a little different. And I appreciate the hard work. And all of you with MDivs and all of the degrees that you have behind your name. But I want you to know that all the letters behind your name are like curls in the pig's tail. It adds no pork to the pig. That was not well received. So I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to back up and we're going to start again. It was amazing. They listened a lot. Because they were like, this dude is different. See, I wasn't interested in impressing anybody in that college. 
I just wanted to preach the word of God, encourage them, and get on with my life. But they weren't receiving it, and I thought, well, dear God, if they're not going to receive it, I'll just have to preach it harder. I've never been invited back, but I had a really good time while I was there. You see, here's what the Bible said. The Bible said in Acts 4.13, Now when these people in the culture saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that these men were uneducated, common men, these people were astonished. And they recognized that these boys, Peter and John, had been with Jesus. We may never be recognized for having perfect grammar, articulating every vowel or syllable, but I'd rather have the power of God and say something a little off grammatically than to say it perfectly grammar. Perfect grammar. I can't even say perfect, perfectly grammar. See, I can't even get that right. Old Dr. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, he said, I'd rather see somebody say, I have saw and seen something than to say I have seen and saw nothing. Now for those of you, those of you that don't care about grammar, that one just went right by you. But if you know a tad bit about grammar, you understand what Bob Sr. said. I'd rather see someone who, who can say I, I, I have saw and seen something than to hear someone say, I have seen and saw nothing. I appreciate the academics. I appreciate scholarship. I appreciate it with all my heart, soul, mind, and body. And I, I want to be a student until the day I die. But I'll tell you what, if I have to trade all my, any, any degree or any, any pursuit of study and just give me the power of God. Because the power of God is what's going to shake people out of their lostness. The power of God is what's going to bring people to repentance. The power of God is going to make a church in America to be a fire. It's the power of God. I don't care to overwhelm you with stunningly beautiful words. But, oh God, take the cornbread and change some hearts. That's my desire. That's my desire. So the Word of God makes it very clear that these men were uneducated according to some standards of their world they lived in at that time, but they had been with Jesus. And I can tell you that the Church of Jesus Christ in the United States of America, I can't speak for other nations, but I can speak for the Church in the United States of America. We need the power of God. We need the power of God. One of the most challenging verses in all of Scripture. I share this one with you. One of the most challenging verses in all of Scripture for me and all other Christians as far as I'm concerned. A, a, a verse that is, has, has impacted me. It's been an apple of gold and it's been a picture of silver since the very probably first time I ever read it. Because this verse internally affects me. Many of you know that over the years, every Sunday, I have... I have issues internally every Sunday and have for years and years and years. Some Sundays are better than others, but almost every Sunday in all of these years that I've been preaching, I have, I have this, internal, this internal angst in me. It's not a bad one, but it moves me in ways that brings me to an attention. Isaiah 66, 2 says, All these things my hand has made, God said. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But then God made a statement that blows my mind. And he said, But this is the one to whom I look. He must be humble, contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. And that verse has been an apple of gold and a picture of silver in my life for most of my life in Christ. God said, if you want me to use you, then you need to be humble in submission to the Word of God. You need to be broken 
ask in your heart for the things that you see. Jeremiah said, mine eye affects my heart. My eye affects my heart. And if what you see in America today, it breaks my heart to see people fight and violent and cruel to one another and to take sticks and beat each other and fight and take a knife and stab somebody or a gun and shoot someone. I live in a rural area. I don't see a lot of that every day. But if I turn on the television for five minutes, that's all I see. And if that doesn't break your heart for this nation, nothing in the world will. And if you say, well, I look at those people and they come out and they're, they deserve it. I understand from a law and order position. But then I go to the next kingdom that I belong to and I think, but what about a grace position that says when God could very easily have brought his wrath down on your life, instead showed you mercy. And for me, I'll let the law and order do their job. That's what they're commissioned and ordained by God for, Romans 13. I believe in it. Law and order. Support your police. Don't ever be stupid and say, we want to defund our police. Dumbest thing you could ever say in the world. You pay these people. You don't muzzle the ox that's taking care of the field. You take care of them. It's a silly statement. It's an exaggeration of the goodness of human nature. Because it says, we don't need the police. We're going to be good. Oh. Okay. Yeah. See, I'm off now. I don't even know where I'm at. But this is what I do know. That every one of us ought to be humble. We ought to be broken for what we see. And then to say this is God's word. We ought to have a sense of trembling in our spirit that we have God's word. And we get the privilege of opening this book every day of our life by the grace of God and to read this book in our own language. And we are able to read it in the English. And I say, God, thank you for those men and those women who spent their lives translating this word so that we could have it in our own language. And that the, that the farmer can read it just like the, the most educated person in any seminary. We can read it because we have it in our language. This is God's Word. And there ought to be a sense of humble trembling in your life that you get to handle God's holy Word. He just, he just, wow. The Puritans used to say this, I'm bringing it down to a close. The Puritan says, if our prayer lives are weak, it is because we believe prayer to be supplemental rather than fundamental. See, if you believe that prayer is just a little present help in the time of need, but you don't understand the power of prayer is a relationship with the personal Son of God, and through He and the power of the Holy Spirit unto the Father we make our prayers, you understand the, the power that, that prayer, prayer is a fundamental in the Christian life. It is a fundamental discipline in the Christian life. It is, it is something that is like if you have a car, the fundamental of a car is not the hubcap or the spare tire. The fundamental of a car is a motor or a transmission. You cannot, you cannot move the car, run the car without the fundamental motor in that car. And I believe in the Christian life that prayer is as essential as a motor in a car as it is in our life if we're going anywhere for God. It is not something supplemental. It is something fundamental. And that's why the writer said, in, and that's why Paul said, Rejoice always. How many of you live that verse out? Rejoice always. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Another little apple of gold and a phrase and a picture of silver for me. 
is that I believe this in my heart, more spiritual growth occurs in the valley than the mountaintop. And I thank God for the mountaintops, don't you? But how many of you know full well when the real growth takes place is down in the gut-wrenching valleys? I love what, what the message says. I love Peterson in, in the way he wrote it in the message. He's paraphrasing. This is a paraphrase. But he said in James 1, 2 through 4, Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at all at you from all sides you know that under pressure your faith life is forced into the open and shows your true colors so don't try to get out of anything prematurely back it up don't try to get out of anything prematurely pray fundamentally pray God Whatever you're doing to fundamentally transform me into the likeness of you, until we get there, I don't need to get out of this. I need to stay in the middle of it. And I just need to tell you, that there's some things in my life that have probably been out of order for a long time. I don't even know how to get them in order. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that where you just think, you know, fix that, and you, and you want to just throw up your hands and go, I don't know how. I really don't know how. But I know God's not going to turn me loose until he does. And the sooner I can be humble and submit, and the sooner I can be broken, and the sooner I can tremble at the word of God, I believe God has a much better opportunity in training me in these areas of my weakness than just being stiff-necked and hard-hearted and difficult to deal with. The Bible said, let God do His work so that you can become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Well, that's an apple of gold and a picture of silver to me. The other statements are these. We can't take other people in our Christian life further than we've gone ourselves. And if you want to help somebody in their Christian life, then you got to get out there in your Christian life. And you got to live your Christian life. And you got to get your own stories from God. And you got to build the confidence that God is trustworthy. And you got to live that life. And when you live the life, and you know God is faithful. You know He's trustworthy. The next time you go into that valley, you know full well God's got a purpose for you in that valley. And rather than you rebelling and just kicking and snorting like a mule, you say, amen, Lord, whatever you need to do in this valley, teach me that I may know a little more about you. I wrote in my notes, the ideal place to serve God is right where he sets you until he moves you. Where do I serve God? Right where he has you. Well, I have a terrible job. Well, I'll tell you, it's not a terrible job if you see it, that God put you there for a purpose in that job, and you can serve God in that job. You be faithful in that job. I could go on. have great verses for all of these. Two things left. Number The, last, the second to the last is this, and I, I felt like God wanted me to say this. It's very important, because I, I could have chose 100 statements that have impacted my life. But I think this is number nine. Marriages that last are not built on infatuation, but love. You need to hear that. Marriages that last are not built on infatuation, but say it, but love. So let's just be real. How many of y'all been married 30 years? How many of y'all ever felt like, I can't stand her? How many hers ever felt like, I can't stand him? Hello? Oh, now y'all start looking down taking notes. <laughs> this is funny.
But if you love them, you love them right through those hard days. Because you know what the Bible said? Love never fails. Ooh, that's a heavy-duty load. But infatuation says, I'll, I'll, I'm infatuated with you as long as you look like I want you to look or act the way I want you to act or do what I want you to do. But how I many of you know life comes and life goes and things change? And infatuation is not what it used to be. But I'll tell you what, love never changes. It's solid. You want to build a great marriage? You do it on love, not on infatuation. And all the married people said, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. I knew that was going to be a little tough for some of y'all to handle, but that gummit is the truth. I know some of y'all are so special, never have any problems in your marriage. Ugh. That was Greek for you make me want to puke, all right? <laughs> okay, the last phrase. So I'm a young Christian, and I'm thumbing through my grandpa's Bible. And I find a phrase, and this is what it said, by C.T. Studd. He said, go ahead and flip it over. C.T. Studd said, so many gamblers for gold, so few gamblers for God. Now see, I need to confess something and then I can go home. My wife knows this. Some of my closest friends know this. Some of you have vices in your life. Some of you are, you love, you know, you just... You just love stuff that's just not right. Pornography. Or drunkenness. Or whatever it may be. But if I'm an open book and I tell you that my probably number one vice, and I've shared this many times with my Joshua's men because I think it's important that everybody is willing to admit the area that they're vulnerable in. Uh, I would be a gambler. I was raised in an atmosphere my whole life in the garage and the junkyard where we gambled on everything. My mom, my dad, my, my mom, my dad gambled on anything. I mean, I, I, I could teach you ways to gamble that you've never known before. I promise you, I, I'm, I got some cool ways to do it. We gambled on everything. I grew up thinking it was so good to benefit from your losses. Think about it. What is gambling? One person benefiting off another person's losses. Now that doesn't quite correlate with God's word that says to love your neighbor as yourself. If I say I just love to take your money or your stuff. That's greedy on my part. That's covetous on my part. That's immoral on my part. My vice is gambling. Isn't it amazing that my daughter chose to marry a boy? His last name is Gamble. I said, Anna, what are you thinking? I shall be reminded of my vice every day of my life. So I said, okay, it's not right for me to gamble for gold. So let's flip my desire and spend the rest of my life gambling for God. What does that mean? That means leaving a really good job out in a suburban area with a brand new house and driving 45 minutes to a small church on a tough road with a dirt parking lot and saying this is where God called us to go and Lisa and I could not quite understand but we both said it's a safe bet because God said do it 
We've been through a lot in 30 years, haven't we, church? But we've had a great time, haven't we? We've had a great time. And I'd like to say, doing the will of God is the safest bet you will ever make in this life. But some of you are so calculated that taking a risk for God is just too big a sacrifice. And you will never know what God can do until you step off into something you can't do. And you have to see God move or you die. That is a great place to live. So many gamblers for gold and so few gamblers for God. When the Lord came out of heaven and was born in a cradle on that beautiful Christmas morning and then rose out of that cradle eventually to walk the dusty roads of Nazareth and Bethlehem, and all of Judea, finally to be placed on a cross and to die for our sins. The world would have said, bad bet, Lord, bad bet. But on the third day, when he come out of that grave, they said, he's good. He's good. So, Lord, we thank you this morning for the word of God. We thank you this morning for the Holy Son of God, the Holy Spirit of God, and our Holy Father. Lord, may every person in this room have a relationship. Every person online today that's listening for the first time or listening today, and they've heard the message over and over and over again, but it's never impacted their heart. I pray today they'd be saved by the Lord of mercy. I pray today, Lord, that this church would be endued with the power of God. Lord, that we would be a church submitted and surrendered to the power of God and that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, we are not here to direct you, but we are here to be directed by you. And Lord, if we can be humble enough and broken enough and tremble enough, you could look to us out here and do something so big We'd be glad we got to be a part, but we'd be sure you got all the glory. Now, I want to say this to you, church, and I'm done. Never touch the glory of God. Never. God alone deserves the glory. We must be a God glorifying church. And the family said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Yeah, please. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us. Adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. I adore. For he alone is worthy. For he alone is worthy for he alone is worthy he cries the Lord I pray Lord as we go our separate ways today that if there's an individual in the room that doesn't know Jesus. Today, my friend, 
you would confess that you're a sinner and you would say Lord I have sinned and I am sorry please forgive me God said whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved if God's moved in your heart you ought to come and confess it the Bible said with the heart man believes unto righteousness with the mouth confession is made unto salvation if you trust in the Lord confess it to somebody today if you're here today and you're a Christian, what will you be remembered for? What are you willing to take the big risk for? Who are you willing to take the risk for? Some of you have invested your whole life in the kingdom of God. I'll guarantee you, you don't feel like a loser today. You know, with Christ, you win. So, Lord, blessings upon these that are be leaving today and give them traveling mercies. May the very light of Christ shine in their faces. May the strength of the Lord give them good posture to be able to live in this life unashamed, confidence in the Lord, boldness for the glory of God. Even though many of us are uneducated and, Lord, we're, we're not sophisticated, we would love to be known as people who have been with Jesus. Blessings now upon every family and home. And let us not be so preoccupied that we forget the reason for the season. Christmas is a beautiful time of the year. Teach me, Lord, to slow down and appreciate the baby born in a manger that changed the world. And all God's people said, amen. God be with you until we meet again. God be with you.